Hey guys, welcome to a brand new episode of Behind the Mask, the podcast where you'll learn everything you need to know before having plastic surgery, because the more you know, the better you look, of course. I'm your host, Gabby Allen, here with my partner in crime, Dr. William. Hey Gabby, how we are you? We should commit crimes. <laughs> yeah, probably some of the things we have done are criminal. That's probably fair. That's a different podcast, though. Well, you know, when that one comes out. For those of you who are just joining us, Dr. William is a board-certified plastic surgeon here in Miami and the creator of the OG method. And today we have a very special guest and friend of Dr. William, I guess your other partner in, yeah. in everything that's Spend not crime, right? We have Frankie Barina. Hi, Frankie. Hi. Welcome, Frankie. Thank you. Frankie nice. is a certified registered nurse and a Oh my God, I did I, this so okay. many times. Why do we I struggle? I pronounce this for Before we started, <laughs> right, you nurse, tell the people. Nurse anesthetist. Anesthetist. Don't worry. I, it took up for me a while. I'm not. So. You have to do it, not me. Most use. people know CRNA. As CRNA, which is, stands for a Certified Registered Nurse Anesthetist. Okay, well, there you have it. Now, my first question um, I want to know is how did you guys meet? How do we know each other here? What's the uh, history? Okay, well, actually, um, me and Carl, or Dr. William, uh, we met about, I'd say about four years ago, you'd mm -hmm. say. Yeah, it was about four years ago. Mm -hmm. He was actually working at a different clinic that we work in now, and uh, I kind of moonlighted um, on certain days of the week mm -hmm. that I was in the hospital. At the time, I was still working at the Cleveland Clinic here in um, South Florida, and um, on my days off, I would actually cover... Uh, some different uh, plastic surgery clinics and we met mostly we worked on Saturdays right yeah I think it was a lot of Saturdays and uh, Carl likes to ask you know a lot of questions and, <laughs> and, and and learn about you like right away like your story your backstory I like to know people's yeah. story yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I get yeah. it me too yeah. you know he's he's that way he's he likes to know oh you know where did you come from you know how did you get here and and so on so we kind of hit it off. Um, I told him many stories about myself. Uh, he was particular fond of um, my stories dating back when before I moved to the United States, mm -hmm. um, and I used to skydive a lot from in Brazil. Brazil. Yeah. And um, actually, when I moved here to the U.S., it was like my my intention was to stay here two years skydiving. Mm -hmm. So you were uh, you were a skydiver, but you were nervous about being in front of the camera, but not nervous about yeah, well, he's terrified <laughs> of cameras. Yeah. I'm the terrified air. of cameras and talking public. And well, you're I, doing a great job, Frankie. Well, Fifteen thousand feet doesn't Cans bother. Out, yeah, him. no. Yeah, ground yeah. level in front of 15, a microphone. Fifteen thousand viewers, forget it. He's yeah. out there. <laughs> he's asleep. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I told him, you know, various stories about myself when I moved here and what, what I went through and etc. Uh, and, um, you know, we started talking and she started calling me two shoots every time. <laughs> uh, I think it's still, I don't, I'm not sure if it's still on his Instagram. Well, one of the highlights was like when there's a little picture of me, there's like two shoots. <laughs> he would make fun of me because of that, because I told him a story about when I was skydiving and I had to open uh, both of my shoots open. It's a long story. We're not going to go over to it today. Well, just so <laughs> you know, Gabby, Frankie uh, told me that he did this jump with a friend of his yeah. and he was going to... They had planned on going into a stadium, a big stadium, where a large soccer match was playing and landing in the stadium. Yeah. So then his friend bailed on him and went the other way. But Frankie's still, yeah. yeah Frankie's very modest about did this you, story. Did you, it's an did incredible we story. Did you execute this? You went into yeah. the Yeah. Well, what actually happened, we were going through a competition, uh, a skydiving competition. And then the uh, competition had ended. So we had a one last jump, which was going to be just a fun jump. Sure. And what happened was in the plane, a buddy of mine said, hey, there's, a, there's an official soccer game going on. Um, let's jump in the stadium. And we can see the stadium from mm -hmm. where we were jumping. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. I was up for anything at that time. Um, wasn't very responsible, let's just put it that way. And uh, so we jumped and we did what we had to do and we opened our chutes and I started going towards the stadium. And the stadium was relatively much lower than where we were supposed to land, which was the airport. And uh, so I'm going towards the stadium. I already have my chute open. 
And then suddenly, I, you know, I start looking sideways, or where's my <laughs> friend? And I see him all the way over there, <laughs> heading to the airport where we're supposed to actually land. And I'm like, holy shit, now I'm by myself. Are you guys um, enemies now? I'm sorry? Are you guys enemies now? No, no, no. He's a <laughs> Just super in that nice moment. guy. I, he actually came here while um, when I already moved to the United mm-hmm. States, and uh, he actually let me uh, borrow his, um, he had a wingman suit. Okay, Have cool. you ever oh, seen yeah, those guys? Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he let me borrow, and that actually was the first time I, I ever flew with a wingman suit. But uh, anyhow, um, my my predicament was either I land on the streets, which had a lot of pole lines, yeah, yeah, electrical yeah. lines, and houses and roofs, mm-hmm. or the actual stadium, which is the mm-hmm. largest space right there. So I'm like, okay, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm just gonna go with it. So I actually went right into the stadium, kind of flew over the, you know, uh, you know the crowd, the crowd, and then landed right smack middle of the game. So oh my God. now the game, you know, the, the referee doesn't know what to do. He's, <laughs> he's, you know, has his whistle and, you know, everybody's like, you know, the, the players Someone are is looking. falling out of the sky. Yeah. Exactly. Well, no, now I'm already landed oh, okay. on the actual uh, middle. You know, imagine, mm-hmm. you, I know you work in, um, you know, as a host in the hockey mm-hmm. games here. So imagine like right in the middle of a hockey game, someone yeah. lands right in the middle. Like, yeah. So now the cops come in, they pull oh, me out no. of the stadium um see this is why i first really like frank okay, like, yeah. whoever does this, this is God, an interesting person in. did you get arrested yeah so they took me well they arrested me there and took me to the um the little office of cbf cbf is like for example nfl okay. nhl their okay. official office in okay. there so they questioned me uh, for quite a while asking why I had done that, what had happened. Mm. I just explained that there was a wind shift yeah, and yeah, yeah. made up all this crazy story. I explained story. A, a complete lie. Yeah, <laughs> a complete lie. I said, no, I just, it, there was this wind shift that pulled me this way and I was between landing mm. on people's roofs yeah. and or, you know, having a terrible accident or this yeah. large space here, which is the Disrupting stadium. Disrupting this. Exactly. <laughs> from, from so game. I'm very sorry and so on and so finally they let me go okay but as soon as they you know they just walked me out of the stadium into the street i had the largest smile on my face i was so happy so it was worth just it. because it, it was it was like the the it was one of the most incredible moments of my life because after i landed you know the crowd started cheering yes. and and, and kind of waving their hands up and i kind of like just you know <laughs> put my arms up oh and, my God. and the whole stadium i imagine a soccer stadium the whole stadium went, went oh my gosh that was your moment exactly. that's amazing it was like i felt like i was a celebrity you or are something. A celebrity. And, and everybody just like cheering it's like you see this whole whole crowd this you know in the soccer stadium which is huge just kind of like make this wave that and is you're there in the so middle you're cool. like so i felt like wow this is it was an amazing Worth feeling it. so i can only imagine like someone that is like famous goes into a stadium and they see everybody <laughs> the crowd just cheering them what they feel like i'm like wow this wow. is amazing thank goodness so, for that wind shift you see then. that's the story he told me when we first met and that's and why we've we been working together ever since that's yeah. a cool story so yeah it's, it's not my anesthesia skills <laughs> it's the the fact that i did you just, bring, you just bring entertainment yes, <laughs> in the exactly. no but it's room. interesting to me it's always been fascinating to me because frankie has put my wife to sleep i mean he's, mm-hmm. he's i trust him completely he's you know, with due respect to every other CRNA that I've worked with. I mean, he's the best. I think he's the safest. He's mm-hmm. super intelligent. He's very well trained. I mean, he's just absolutely, in my mind, the epitome of what it should be a CRNA. And then on the other hand, he's a parachuter and yeah. he drops into a stadium. That's so cool. I mean, that's such a... D- You've because got his layers, personality Frankie. is not like that. Yeah. He's very safe, very mm-hmm. controlled, very methodical, meticulous, you know. You gotta put it somewhere. Not excitable, and then all of a sudden you have this, so. Yeah, I actually love boring in the (laughs) OR. I used to call them two shoots because of that. I I love that story, I love it. Frankie, two shoots. Well, we're not here to talk about uh, um, jumping. No, no. Skydiving. You don't do it anymore, though. No, no, I haven't haven't skydived in probably 12 years or 13 years, something like that. And how many years have you guys been working together? About five years now, I would say. Yeah, about five years. And um, 
just you know basically us together by about three years three now. years solid yeah. yeah three years solid well i think it'll be really cool for our listeners to get um a kind of behind the scenes look at your role with dr william in surgery kind of what goes on with the anesthesia um so i guess but before we jump into that could you get just give us just like a little background of your professional history just for our listeners to get the Tell other story, background you. of you okay well um when I'm, how do you I'm, become a crna okay so I moved to the U.S. In, back in 2002. Uh, soon after that, I actually went into nursing school. Mm -hmm. And um, I started nursing school. I was always, always very interested in the health sciences. Um, and so I went into nursing. And while I was in nursing, and one of the rotations actually was in the operating room, and um, it was actually, they were doing a, what they call a cabbage, which is a coronary artery bypass surgery. And so, heart surgery. Yeah, heart surgery. So basically, you know, it, it was, you know, it, first time you're in an operating room, especially in a surgery of that magnitude, it's, it's pretty amazing to see, you know, what can be done, you know. And uh, so I saw, you know, multiple parts of many people, everybody kind of synchronized what they were doing. And, um, you know, alone behind the drape so you have behind the mask but you know behind the drape well, i might start my own thing yeah do the behind the drape. drape so it was um actually a nurse anesthetist and he was doing the anesthesia uh for this procedure and uh he was quite busy he was you know he was monitoring all the vital signs of the patient he was running uh, multiple drips of medications in order to support support you know the cardiovascular system. You know what he was really doing, Gabby? Probably like a New York Times crossword. Yeah, puzzle that's what I was thinking. No, yeah. Oh, I'm no. Pretty sure. yeah, right. <coughs> no, Pretending well, like you're well, following all this information. Well, not with heart. It's all alarms. You know. No, not 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 with heart music. surgery. <laughs> yeah, not with heart surgery. He's making but there was also there. one detail, you know, to to kind of drive that home uh, is that. He was also the only one that got to sat, sit down in the operation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He was, I was always know, envious you know, of he anesthesia. He was busy. He was busy. He'd do those drips and he was doing all, all his things, you know, adjusting anesthesia gases and such. But he got to sit down and, you know, for a, a good portion of the procedure, just kind of chill and just kind of monitor. Chill. And he said, that's I'm the like, job for me. That's the job for me. That's what I want to do. <laughs> so, um, you know, I started researching because I didn't even know that there were nurse anesthetists. You know, I, I, I thought that only anesthesiologists um, did anesthesia, but um, behold, I, I was made Which aware. Which are MDs, just to kind yeah. of clarify, you can, yeah. you can provide anesthesia as a nurse or as a medical doctor, and the medical doctors are anesthesiologists. And the, but now really in the hospitals, the CRNAs are actually there taking care of the patient, and then you'll have one anesthesiologist supervising a whole group of CNRs. But the people that are there are the CRNAs taking care of patients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mo m nine times out of ten, most of the times the actual person doing your anesthesia in the operating room is a nurse anesthetist. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I kind of started researching. Um, I already had this idea in my mind as a nurse, uh, you know, doing nurse practitioner or something in that in the, in that kind of way. And I I started looking into nurse anesthesia. I'm like, wow, this is this seems like a really nice, cool field. And especially I was doing a rotation in cardiovascular intensive care unit, which is the the actual the nurses that recover a patient after heart surgery. Oh, wow. And it's very demanding, and there's a lot of knowledge to, that goes uh, into the nurses that, that do that kind of work because they they run. It's 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 a little bit more advanced nursing where you're running very um, you know uh, particular medications that are essential to maintain the actual function of the heart and and the, the yeah, whole it's process. It's huge job. Yeah, it's huge, and this it's just it's very complex, and I I, I was very interested in that area. I was lucky that um, that it, they decided, you know, in the last semester in nursing school, especially uh, at least in my program, they 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 put the nursing students in particular units, and uh, not to pat myself on the back, but it's based on your your grades and your mm -hmm. GPA. They would put you in the most advanced units, and I in one more of my class got CVICU, mm -hmm. which is like the top. 
and then you know it's you the most difficult the most, most difficult. challenging so i got i go i got placed there on my last semester and i just i just did the best work i could do in order mm -hmm. to like shine and so the nurse manager and the charge nurses could like you know kind of mm -hmm. like wow them yeah. so maybe i can get hired yeah which is not very common because usually they want you know you to have a certain amount of experience in a step down unit or you know a, um, a med surge unit and then you kind of move up into icu intensive care units but i got it and i went straight from my you know from school i went into a six-month training program within the cardiovascular intensive care unit um, and i stayed there for two years um, working recovering patients for from open heart surgery until I got accepted into the nurse anesthesia program which now is a doctorate program and uh, I got accepted and then I went in for my training for another three and a half years Wow! do you, do you think that any of your I know you came from Brazil and you had some other occupations prior to going to nursing school do you think any of those other jobs prepared you for your CNA. I'm thinking specifically of your work when you arrived here at the Sears Auto Center. Did that? <laughs> did that help you? Tell us about this. No, not really. I did uh, many different odd jobs. I took on um, two different, uh, two three jobs at once at times when I got here. It's very difficult. I had this whole different idea of what it would be like to arrive in the United States. I would get here. I would easily find a job. I had. Uh, pretty extensive background in 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 IT. I uh, worked for my family company in Brazil for many years, and uh, and I said, well, it's going to be easy. I'm going to get there. I, I had some programming um, uh, training in Brazil, and it's going to be easy. And it was. It was. It was a lot more difficult than I ever imagined. Imagine I was going to come here for two years, save up some money, and go back to Brazil and skydive. Oh. Because <laughs> I had two places that I that I was going to go to mm -hmm. here to the to the U.S. It was either Orlando, which is the one that I ended up going because mm -hmm. there's a really good uh, drop zone um, in, in the land. One of the biggest drop zones. Drop zones is where people go to skydive. Yeah. Um, and the or Utah, mm -hmm. which I was going to go in order to base jump, which is jumping from cliffs. You know. Mm -hmm. So I ended up going with Orlando, which was great. Um, and then, you know, everything kind of didn't quite work out how I imagined it would work mm -hmm. out. And I remember my click. And that click was one of my three jobs, you know, between the, um, the Sears Auto Center, the um, retention center in uh, AOL, which is, you know, when you call to... Do you know what AOL is? Yes, I know what AOL is. America Online, like, you got mail. I'm not, yeah. that, I'm not as young as I yeah. look. Well, so I, so but it's old. All, the all terrible job. I, I love that, like, trying I'm, to get people to, to... To not cancel. To hang on to their AOL membership <laughs> exactly. at a time where everything everybody's, is completely Everybody's going... Yeah, exactly. Everybody was getting... That's your job. Yeah. So there's no such oh thing God. as a cancellation department. <laughs> <laughs> when you, when you, I think gyms when, operate the same way. Exactly. Like you're just There's not allowed no such, to cancel. Like within the company, oh, you know, you call and you say, hey, I want to, I want to talk in the cancellation department. They transfer you to the retention center. Yeah. Oh. It's not called the cancellation mm -hmm. department. It's called the retention center. And you're supposed to retain customers. Like, and you have a quota. You have to maintain 60%. So out of 10 people who call you, you have to make sure that six stick don't with give the up company. their don't a give AOL up. services exactly so there's all ways to try to convince them otherwise but I mean that's a whole other conversation but um and then one of them was telemarketing and the other <laughs> oh my goodness and then you that through job, it. that job well no this was all the same time going on oh it's three jobs yeah so one of them was a, a, um, a telemarketing and I was supposed to give away beepers. <laughs> oh, perfect. I don't, mine just broke. I need a new beeper. <laughs> yeah, well, see, nobody wanted beepers anymore. You just, you just went like, into like technology. You're like, okay, this is a failing, uh, obsolete <laughs> technology. <laughs> Frankie right now, the other day, was telling industry. me he was trying to get something with Kodak. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so this was 2003, something like that. And you know, nobody had beepers anymore. Mm -hmm. So I'm supposed to call, cold call people on this list of numbers and just say, hey, you want a beeper? 
<laughs> you know, and I just give you the information no. and, and go through this whole spiel. And, you know, I actually, I mean, uh, the success rate is dismal, to say the least. <laughs> yeah. Every now, of course, uh, you get someone that's very gullible and they'll think that they're really going to get a beep, you know, some, some grandma, grandpa in their house, which is, is kind of sad. I actually feel bad that I did that job in you the first sold place. Some, but you didn't do anything. I think they didn't even pay me my last check, and it was like seven dollars an hour. This is ridiculous. Hey, if you guys are in the market for some beepers, we know yeah, a guy. Frank, yeah. he'll hook you up. <laughs> I'll hook you up. So, this lady, she, I, I'm like, I go through. You know, you, they pick up the phone. You just have to start talking. You know, ah, you got the beeper. You want the beeper? <laughs> and not allow them to try to cut you. You know, you're trying to get as much as your little script down as possible stressful and then after i see all this and then the lady calmly said what's your name i'm like frankie and then out of like a t you know she just screamed frankie get a real job <laughs> and hung up and then you did wow and, thanks and lady and, and, and i'm kind of sensitive you know uh, no, I get I'm it. a Me too. sensitive yeah, person, yeah. and I just, I just, I can see you laughing there. <laughs> His uh, sister, there's my so sister's on the other side. So I, I, I put the phone down, and I mean, I can feel the tears just starting to like, you know, water my mm. eye, and I'm just trying to hold things together, and I just. And I couldn't make any other call. I just stood there with my little headphone thing. <laughs> oh my and, god! And I'm saying like, I'm gonna finish this day. <laughs> no. get, get to my whatever no. hour. I'm not gonna call anyone else. <laughs> and I was just like, that's it. That's oh, Frankie, we've it. all been there. And then you gotta yeah. go to your car and cry. So and then exactly. you gotta come back inside. It's all. No, no, I cried many times. Oh. I remember when I was at Sears Auto Center. There was one day that I got so mad. I'm like, I am gonna leave this country. <laughs> and I left. I was in the in the customer service. I was actually the only one that early in the morning. I left. I left. <laughs> Sears Auto Center had no one in the front desk. Trust me, there had no one. If someone came in, I went into my car, I locked the door, I started crying, and I said, I'm going to leave, I'm going to go home, I'm going to pack my bags, and yeah. I'm going to go back to Brazil. You I'm are like, not allowed to be mean to him yeah. ever. We were protecting well, him. <laughs> I'm, I'm always mean to Frankie yeah. because Great. Great. I love Frankie, and you he's like my Frankie. younger brother. Aww. And I cannot help but tease him <laughs> incessantly. Oh he loves it. When something goes or doesn't work out for <laughs> it's me, your fault. he absolutely loves it. He's like, I I'm sorry, but this makes me laugh. And, and, and he, he just goes off you on it. You guys are seeing the truth about yeah. Dr. Williams. I tell him now. I get my jollies from yeah. his follies. <laughs> yes, he says that all the time. So anyhow, um, I stayed like 15, 20 minutes in the car and then just said you know what just kind of like shook it off opened the door went back mm -hmm. stood there in my little customer service spot waiting for the next person to come in and you know whatever get their new tire or, i mean it's an amazing story though frank you know it is you went back a, in you went back inside and you finished the day and that's hard to do no, no i continue at sears water center that was my main job so i continued that <laughs> well, one you did I had, it. I some people wouldn't rent. go back and i had to pay rent. i did not go back for the telemarketing job that that was the turning point in my life yeah I, I, I kind of like at that point i said you know what i have to do something either i'm going to go out get an education and you know do something that's meaningful and that's going to make me happy yeah. or i'm just going to leave because to be here in the united states at that point uh i was completely by myself it was me and my little yorkie and i still had a dog how did i have time to have a dog <laughs> my poor dog he was really good is the dog at, still at the, alive no he actually oh, passed away a couple story, years yeah Gabby. yeah his oh, name was bacon no, I'm sorry bacon, bacon. Yeah. bacon. oh okay and bacon died Shout just bacon. a couple years ago I got a new dog. Viva la bacon. He's great. <laughs> okay, new dog. We're good guess now. What, guess what his new dog's name is? Eggs. Waffle. Oh, Waffle. hey, that wasn't too far off. <laughs> no. That's cute. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, anyhow, then at that point, I started looking, and then I decided you know, to go into nursing school. Health, health sciences mm -hmm. was all, always an area that I wanted to get into. Um, I actually started a psychology degree in Brazil. Uh, I did it for like about six months. I didn't mm -hmm. really – I didn't – really didn't do my fancy so mm -hmm. i didn't continue but the funny thing is is in brazil you have to do this test to get into the college so you, you go through high school and then you do a test like called the sat right um, i'm guessing 
It's a little different. I think but anyway, what you, you've you described is more like a um, you, like an aptitude kind okay. of test yeah. to figure out what might be your best. No, career. it's not quite no? that. It's 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 you actually do a test for a particular school. So for every school that you apply, you do a test for for that school. Mm. So I I was so like I just I wasn't studying. I had been and and suddenly I just um, I signed up for it. So yeah, I try this out and then. On the day of the test, I wasn't even going to go because I was going to go skydive. I'm like, you know, guys were going to skydive. I'm like, yeah, of course I'm going to go too. But then it started raining. So I'm like, oh, okay. All right, so I'll go take the test. I, I took the test, I passed, and then I got into the school. But then I just stayed six months and left. But anyhow, then, you know, at that point here in the U.S., after the Frankie get a real job, <laughs> uh, wake up call, I, you know, decided to start pursuing nursing. And then, you know, the rest we already discussed before. That's how I kind of geared it toward nurse yeah. anesthesia. Wow, that's a very interesting and fun story. I mean, now I'm sure not living it, obviously, yeah, no. not without tears, but... Hey, you're worth it. Yeah, no, it was completely worth it. You worked so hard. That's amazing. That's a beautiful story and hilarious. Thank you. Um, (laughs) So, well, first, I want to know, in Brazil, is it referred to as a Brazilian butt lift? Or is it just a regular butt lift? (laughs) Exactly. It's it's like, um, you don't call it French bread in France. Right, it's bread. So, in Brazil, they don't. Nobody knows what a Brazilian butt lift is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I I travel often to Brazil uh, for vacation and whenever I go and says, mm-hmm. oh, what's the, you know, I, I told my friends, oh, I mostly work with plastic surgery. And they're like, oh, what the procedures that you don't do the Brazilian butt lift. They're like, well, Brazilian butt lift, what the hell is that? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, actually, um, it, and the, the procedure there goes by lipo mm-hmm. which in translation means lipo grafting. Mm-hmm. So that's what Brazilians know that procedure okay. by. So it's not really, they, they don't, Really, but they you know. were the pioneers. I okay. mean, they, they they were the ones that really realized you could take fat and remove it and then place it. I mean, there's a very Brazil has a very rich history of plastic surgery and their contributions to to mm-hmm. plastic surgery is worldwide is very well known. But uh, Doctor uh, Ivo Pitangi. Yeah, you say it better than, than I yeah, do. Yeah, I know you were going to min- mispronounce <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, thank I've you, Frankie. You, I've seen you saying his name. That was your cue Most of the in. time, no, this is like a glory <laughs> moment. Because most of the time, obviously English is my second language, mm-hmm. you know, he's correcting my pronunciation. Mm-hmm. And uh, not, not in a mean no, way. No, not in a mean I way. I never do that. Which is actually never. very helpful. You yeah. know, for the, for the longest time, I always call it a mute point, a mute point. Mm-hmm. And he's like, moot. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. So he actually helped. Has yeah. Well, Frankie me speaks with my Portuguese, Spanish, and English. So, oh, yeah. I, but his his grasp of English is fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. And, and good for you. You speak three languages. That's uses amazing. Words that, you know, you would think if that's your third language, you probably wouldn't use those words. Mm-hmm. But every once in a while, I try and chip in and help yeah. you out. No, no, yeah. I mean, that, and most help. of the time it is teasing yeah. and, and ridiculing and being... And then being, you can slip in bullying mean, but then under I, the blanket yeah, like of bullying. teasing. Got um, it. <laughs> but then I do do some nice, helpful corrective. Yeah. No, Thanks. of course. No, he does. So yes, um, like I said, it's um, it's not known as Brazilian butt lift there. And um, Ivo Pitangui, as he mentioned, was one of the pioneers in the 1960s. Yeah. He was doing this procedure Think and, about that. and actually publishing mm-hmm. in the 19, as far back as the yeah. 1960s. That's like over 60 years ago. Yeah. Wow. So um, you are the last person the patient sees before they go night night. So what is the process from, I guess, when you meet the patient to when they're you know, out to sleep, what things do our listeners need to kind of know to be best prepared for the process while they're, you know, undergoing the surgery or if there's any pre or post-op things that your role kind of plays into for patients? All right, well, you know, before I ever actually meet the patient, Mm -hmm. I meet them through their charts. Mm -hmm. You know, I kind of like have to go over their past medical history if there is any, um, actually, if there's uh, any coexisting diseases or medications that they're on, their labs, their EKG, and their medical uh, clearance to make sure that, you know, everything is okay. And then finally, you know, uh, I meet the patient on the day of surgery uh, for my pre-op evaluation. And um, I kind of go over everything that they're going to 
what I see is that most patients are very anxious for surgery and the greatest part of the anxiety itself is not knowing what's gonna happen. Yeah. That makes people nervous. Mm -hmm. Usually people who have never had surgery are the ones who, who come in or are, in, are in the most nervous. Sure. And so what, what actually I think that helps the most is that I kind of like, after I do my physical examination and uh, talk to them about the procedure itself, I actually go through everything that's going to happen to them step by step of what to expect from the time that I'm starting their IV, that they're going to be moved to the operating room, mm -hmm. what's gonna happen to them when they get into the operating room, and how they're gonna fall asleep, how they're gonna wake up, and you know what's what to expect right. when they're actually waking mm -hmm. up, what are they gonna probably be feeling, what's normal. Because then it is, you know, 99.9% uh, .9 of the time, it, it works exactly as I described. Mm -hmm. So as you, you know, they know exactly what's happening, they're not feeling very anxious. Right. So you take away that not knowing, mm -hmm. then you're, you know, they feel Which more I comfortable. Which I imagine makes, you know, the time that they're actually under and you're controlling their vitals and stuff, the less stressed they are, does that translate into, you know, better management for their anesthesia? Well, after they're under anesthesia, mm -hmm. it, their 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 anxiety or or anything that they were feeling before <coughs> it does it's not, not active, come. Yeah, right? it's not active. Mm -hmm. You know, so the anesthetic and the sedation mm -hmm. is going to abate anything. You know, people like to think you know they're gonna they're they associate anesthesia with you know sleeping, mm -hmm. which is is very common to think that they're just sleeping, but it's not. Anesthesia is an induced coma. You don't dream. Yeah under anesthesia you are you're you're in a, 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 a induced coma state mm -hmm. and uh, for you time during the anesthetic is is non-existent like right. you close your eyes and suddenly you're already awake and mm -hmm. surgery's done you yeah. know some some patients they like I'm, I'm done already yeah you know a lot of people mm -hmm. wake up thinking they don't know I, i've had the surgery and then you know they, maybe they start feeling a little sore a little bit mm -hmm. of pain they're like oh yeah i, I had the surgery yeah. especially if they had lipo what do you think um, patients need to know about anesthesia before electing to have surgery or going through this process? Like, what are some things that you know people should be aware of? And yeah, well, what about some myths too? Because I, I think that's I, yeah, that I have a myth that I want busted, so oh, yeah? we can get there. Yeah, what myth? Um, I heard that redheads have more of a sensitivity to anesthesia. Is that true? Well, actually, you take more anesthesia. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. So there is some. So there is actually some resistance there. Interesting. Uh, so you you actually use you would have to use. So that goes into. So um, it's no match for me. <laughs> no. Well, no. Yeah, Frankie no. always enough. wins. Yeah. Enough. Yeah. 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 You'll knock me out. Yeah, yeah. He, he always wins. <laughs> Every now and then you get that person says, "Oh, you're not going to be able to put me to sleep." And oh no, I put me to sleep. Can I? <laughs> in, 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 yeah, most of the time is the one that like you blink and you're like they're yeah, already they're out. Yeah, they're fine. Yeah. So Can I ask you a question, Frankie? And, and I know this is pr just separate. Um, what actually puts you, you're not sleeping, you're in an induced coma, but we, we, and you do too, we call it a sleep. Yeah, we call it a sleep. And because it, it looks the same. I mean, you can't really tell if someone's in a coma versus someone sleeping. Um, but what do you actually use to put someone to sleep? Okay. So... So the induction process of anesthesia, we use propofol, okay, which is a very safe drug. And uh, that's a Michael Jackson drug. Exactly. So it got a bad rap <laughs> just a few years back um, when Michael Jackson passed away because obviously he was he was using it uh, without the care of a you know a provider, of someone sure. watching over him during the whole process. Uh, so you know a lot of people like to think oh. What is the anesthesia? Is it's that one drug? No, it's not mm -hmm. one drug. It's three parts. There's you know the sedation, which is going to give you amnesia. It's going to put you to sleep or induce coma state. There is uh, muscle relaxation, which mm -hmm. we we give muscle relaxants for, and there's analgesia, which is uh, medications for pain. So it's actually most of the time is 
anesthesia is composed of all these three parts and they they have a synergistic effect between them and different medications that so we So you're give. making like a cocktail here. Yes. You're a mixologist. Exactly. Frankie's the exactly. bartender. Exactly. He is exactly. Bartender. So that's and then that goes into, you know, knowing the importance of what the patients mm -hmm. medications that the patients are taking because they can sure. have certain adverse effects mm -hmm. with things that I'm giving. Um, so we like, that's why one of the reasons we have to go through medication list and know, understand exactly what they're mm -hmm. on. But when I watch you, when you push the propofol, that's it. That's it. That's what, that's turns the lights out. Yeah. That puts them to sleep. And just cause we mentioned Michael Jackson. I mean, Michael Jackson would still be alive today if you were there with him when he had the propofol just, or any anesthesia provider that could breathe for him mm -hmm. exactly. because he just basically had too much and he couldn't breathe he couldn't breathe on his own and that's why but not because you, it's a bad you drug. put the airway in because the response is actually dose dependent mm -hmm. you know for the propofol so even when you go to get a um, a colonoscopy or endoscopy you're not put under general anesthesia you're given you're given propofol yeah. also but at smaller intermittent doses mm -hmm. that you still breathe but you're out. Yeah. So, and then, but it's different for when we do it for general anesthesia, which we give a larger dose right up front and put you to sleep immediately. But the propofol is actually not what, what's going to keep you asleep throughout the whole procedure. Okay. That's just to put you asleep initially. And then there are anesthesia gases that are maintained throughout the whole procedure mm -hmm. that are going to um, actually keep you asleep. And then a lot of people, you know, I, I think it's funny because a lot of people, and, and what do you give me to wake me up? I'm like, nothing. Exactly. You actually wake yourself up yeah. because I just turn off the anesthesia gases oh. and you just kind of breathe it out. And as you breathe it out, you start waking up on your own. So it's, it's not... It's not that I give you something to wake you up. I don't have to reverse mm -hmm. the sedation part of the anesthesia. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of times I do have to reverse the muscle relaxation, okay. but not the part that's keeping you asleep. And I, I like muscle relaxation, as Frankie oh, well yeah, knows. Oh, he is big <laughs> on muscle relaxation. <laughs> no, I'm sure. Well, now, it's, I use it because of... Uh, I don't uh, think I've ever used so much muscle <laughs> relaxation in my whole career until I start working. <laughs> well, when I do breast... Uh, surgery we're manipulating the chest muscle yeah. and we're putting the implant underneath of it most times and mm -hmm. and so if that muscle is not paralyzed mm -hmm. it just it's fighting you the whole time and you can't get the pocket that you want to get so I, I remember that was one of our initial things where you know I would because they always give a little bit of muscle relaxant mm -hmm. during the induction phase of the anesthesia okay I mean I've seen Frankie push the drug so many times, I always tease him, pretty sure I could do this job. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I'm pretty sure you couldn't. <laughs> so, Good. But um, they give a little bit of that muscle relaxant, mm -hmm. you know, at the beginning. And um, then when Frankie and I first started, and I, then I would start operating. It, well, there's always a delay between when the patient goes to sleep yeah, and, you know, then he has to put the airway and, and all that, and then the patient has to be want the sterilize the skin and mm -hmm. draped and everything so there's always a delay yeah. but i would ask frankie when i started doing the breast and the, the muscle and it was really moving a lot and it's very hard I'd, I'd be like you know can you give her mm. some more muscle relaxant he would always say i already gave it <laughs> on induction yeah and then i was like okay that's great can we have some, some more, more? <laughs> and he's like well this guy really likes the muscle <laughs> relaxant <laughs> But I mean, it's a component, um, but it, it's really helpful for me. Mm -hmm. And he's a master at doing it because it, it can delay the way you wake up. So I don't yeah. know how he does it, mm -hmm. the dose he uses it, but I get perfect relaxation that I need. Mm -hmm. And then the patient wakes up exactly on time. Now, is there a different um, protocol or the way you go about this cocktail depending on the procedure? Like, does it differ from a BBL to lipo? Or is it just kind of getting the person asleep and relaxed in the well, state they need? The thing is, we're, with a BBL and the lipo, he doesn't really need muscle relaxation. Mm -hmm. So I, I use muscle relaxation in the beginning of the case in okay. order to more easily mm -hmm. uh, secure the patient's <laughs> airway with an endotracheal tube. But then afterwards, during the procedure, I do not usually redose any mm -hmm. muscle relaxation. It's not necessary throughout mm -hmm. the procedure. Um, but then later on, 
for not later on, but I'm sorry, but um, for breast augmentations or for breast lifts or tummy tucks and so on, then he does need that continuous muscle relaxation throughout the procedure. So I have to redose and I actually have to, it, it's, it's not as easy as, as sometimes he makes it think <laughs> that it is. Well, because uh, sometimes uh, it's anesthesia like, and surgery it, always yeah, fight. Yeah, you know? okay. because, oh, because th- sometimes he's just like, like the two of you? Nah, <laughs> not just us, every, every She's not person. relaxed. Or, but yeah. I have to see, I have to start judging the yeah. patient's response to the dose that I gave. Mm-hmm. Because, um, you know, I, I use um, a particular muscle relaxant and it has a certain variability in its duration of action, okay. meaning the time which it's working. So for s- I- I- in this particular one, uh, which is the most commonly used one, rocuronium, it actually has a considerable variability mm-hmm. sometimes depending on person to person and okay. how long it works. Okay. So for some, for s- one person, I may give a certain dose and you know they'll be completely relaxed for mm-hmm. 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour. For another person, within mm-hmm. 15 minutes, 20 minutes, they've have m- metabolized the whole thing and the person's no l- longer relaxed. Mm-hmm. So I have to, s- gauge from you know seeing him complain to me yeah don't and worry about that I, stuff I, you know I, that like more oh, juice frankie this, yeah that's all he says more yeah. juice more juice frankie and then i'm <laughs> like and then when i start doubting yeah that you know i start checking you know, there's ways to check patients response to the muscle mm-hmm. relaxing by electrical activity mm-hmm. um eliciting a twitch response okay um and then you know when i see there's no twitches then i i know that you know, it's hard, but it's because the patient's hard. It's not yeah. the muscles completely relaxed. Yeah. So there's other ways of me He'll checking. Tell me that when too. I when I don't trust. There's no twitches. Yeah. There's no twitches. We love the open, you're complete, honesty, open You're completely relaxed. Yeah. And then he'll be like, okay. okay, and then he'll go on, and then won't complain much anymore. So then you have to, uh, like you were saying, you see the chart of the patient before you actually meet the patient, you see their blood work and uh, medical history. Do you also have to consider um, or get the information as far as variables, like their exercise habits, their diets, like like I mentioned with my hair, what if somebody dyes their hair and you don't know that they are actually a redhead or not? And then would that you know dictate your, you know, how you then treat them? Well, you know. Or you get that information like pre-op. Yeah, well, I get most of their from their clearance. There's mostly all their family history, okay. and but but still, even with you with like the redhead, mm-hmm. yes, there is you know a literature saying that redheads need more anesthesia. But it's example. not going to drastic. But it's not it's not it's not so drastic. Mm-hmm. And I drive my anesthesia based on your hemodynamic response. Remember, I'm monitoring many different things yeah. throughout the procedure. Uh, and based on your response, your unique response mm-hmm. is I'm adjusting my anesthesia. So, so you're kind of like a DJ yeah. then so <laughs> with e- all these different a, levels. There's a, there is a lot of fluidity yeah, no, to it, even though it's science-based. Sure. It's, a, it's a lot so of... So that's why they say it's science and patient. art. I yeah. have to read the moment and yeah. because what's enough anesthesia for you might not be for someone just it's, like yeah, you. Yeah, right. Like, yeah. you know, your same weight, your same height, mm-hmm. your same... Uh, hair color, sure. it might not affect that mm-hmm. person as much as you. So it's completely different. So yes, we 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 go in t- with the premise of those factors of a patient's weight, their volume of distribution, mm-hmm. and etc. In order to dose medications, but yeah. then we have to j- to adjust accordingly based on that person's response. Mm-hmm. So I'm looking at your vital signs that are being read continuously throughout the procedure to know if you're deep enough under anesthesia, mm-hmm. if you're light, if, you know, if where I'm at yeah. in order to adjust to go up or down. So I'm kind of managing at that throughout the whole time. Wow. So you have to procedure. be incredibly focused. And yeah. and I have to, um, what's mo- most important is like, I have to be able to see you because monitors can tell me so much, yeah. but monitors have faults. Sometimes they're giving me a number, a reading that I can't trust. Yeah. So sometimes I get a bad reading on a blood pressure reading or anything like that. And I can't just, oh, the blood pressure is low. I'm going to give a medication quickly mm-hmm. in order to bring it back up. Well, was the reading correct? Yeah. I have to verify that the reading was okay, especially during lipo. And while he's liposuctioning, the patient's vibration, sure. vibrating. And the, the, the way the blood pressure uh, 
blood pressure cuff works, it reads vibrations under your skin. So if he's vibrating the patient, that reading might not be good. So I'll tell him, stop, take another <laughs> blood pressure. If someone's doing a breast augmentation, they have the elbow on the blood pressure cuff. Mm -hmm. Does that ever happen? Does that ever happen? Never <laughs> happens to me. <laughs> or they have a lot of pressure on their arm and then the pulse oximeter, which is the oxygen yeah. saturation, starts going down. I'm like, hmm. oh, but you know, I know to look at the patient, yeah. to look at their lip mm -hmm. color, and, and I know oh, they look like they're doing okay. Mm -hmm. And then I check the oximeter. Hey, can you uh, push, yeah. his, yeah, push, uh, push his arm? Try not. And then it starts free. It doesn't happen frequently, but mm -hmm. it has happened in the yeah. past. And it's, 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 it's a known fact that there's, you, you can't just look at numbers on a monitor and act based on those numbers. Sure. You have to be able to read the patient. You have to consider That's, all factors. Yeah, you yeah. have to be able to look at the patient and know what's going on without necessarily, you just not just going but by also what's giving being Yeah, feedback. Yeah, yeah we have to work together to, continuously. Yeah. yeah. What? So you said, so obviously we know how you go to sleep, basically with your cocktail and, and propofol is kind of the final hammer, mm -hmm. if you will. And then um, you wake up, just you turn off everything and the patient's already metabolized and so they wake up. What about the question of patients having awareness or waking up during surgery? Yeah, I've seen that movie before. Talk about that yeah. because that, that's a concern for people. I personally have never experienced it. Have, have you? Well, no, actually I've never experienced awareness under anesthesia. I've, I've fortunately never had a patient um, mention it to me. But I do understand where it comes from. Um, statistically speaking, the chances of that happening is 0.1%. And I've, uh, I've actually made a video in the past before uh, in reference to this. It's the chances are minuscule and they're more common in emergency procedures or open heart procedures. And there's a reason for that. One of the things they're nervous is about not waking up. Mm -hmm. And the other one is waking up. Too soon. So a lot, yeah. so a lot of times they'll, they'll turn to me uh, and, they'll, and, and they'll tell me, and they'll tell me, ah, uh, just make sure I don't wake up. I'm like, what? Ever? Yeah. I'm like, oh, no, no. Yeah. I want to wake up at the end of the procedure. But like I said, the, the chances of that happening are very small. And the reason a lot of people report uh, having known someone that had awareness of anesthesia, uh, under anesthesia, is that actually a lot of times people aren't actually under general anesthesia. Mm. So you might be under sedation or what we called MAC, which is monitored anesthesia care. And that is when we give small amounts of med a medication, like for example, like the, the previous example, like during an endoscopy, a colonoscopy, um, a cataract surgery mm -hmm. and such, that we give a minuscule amount of, of medications just to keep you lightly sedated, and but it's possible to arouse you with enough stimulation. Okay. But sometimes it's not communicated effectively to the patient that that's the type of anesthesia that they're gonna be getting, mm -hmm. that it's just a sedation, that they're gonna be comfortable because those patients will fluctuate a little exactly. bit throughout and they'll become aware. They'll become conscious and unconscious yeah. throughout because that's like if someone is titrating the medication continuously during that procedure, they're being given little squirts or you know of the medication mm -hmm. throughout the procedure. And the way that the anesthetist or anesthesiologist is monitoring that is based on their response. So when they see that they're starting to come to, We'll give some more okay. and some more. So then Because you can't give too much or they won't be breathing. Exactly. Because w there's a particular amount that you'll give that they'll stop breathing. And then, and you, then and it becomes, and then it's not no longer a sed sed uh, sedation case. It becomes general anesthesia. Mm -hmm. And the right thing to do in that case is to secure the airway with either a laryngeal mask airway, which is a supraglottic airway, mm -hmm. or an endotracheal tube which I'll be able to control the amount of breathing that you have throughout the whole time during the procedure. And I'll be breathing for you or the anesthesia machine. So you think a lot of people th think, because uh, we've certainly had patients that, that have said to us like, well, I was aware last time of my surgery. I don't want to be aware this time. And then uh, Frankie said, well, this is a general anesthetic. You know, when you yeah. had your um, whatever, uh, EGD or colonoscopy or something, that wasn't 
Mm-hmm. Eight. And so I think there that's a lot of misconception. Yeah, and too. we we've actually caught people on this when they're telling us this sometimes. I remember there was one time that you were still in the room where, where they were mentioning this to me, and then they said that they got up and they spoke. They said, hey, I'm still awake, or, or said something. Well, you can't really speak mm-hmm. if you have an endotracheal tube sure. in your mouth yeah. because it goes it past your vocal cords. Mm-hmm. You can't really mm-hmm. produce any sound. Yeah. And I think also sometimes probably when patients are waking up, they can be in and out of sort of consciousness and that may give them a little impression that, oh, well, I was awake because I I remember the OR lights or Mm -hmm. or something along those lines. But true awareness under a general anesthetic is extremely rare and and neither one of us have seen it. What is it from? If you if you do have that awareness, what what's that caused by? The awareness? Is, yeah. Well, you weren't under. Well, you have phases of anesthesia, and you weren't you hadn't attained uh, phase three, which is of general anesthesia. A of deep enough law, state. A, a deep enough state of loss of consciousness. So you could be paralyzed, not moving, with the muscle relaxant, but aware. You, but aware. But you can't move. Yeah. Exactly. That sounds like my nightmare. No, and it is, and I think that's what people are are afraid of. of. Yeah, right. Frankie's giving the other medications that are going on, so it's impossible to uh, yeah to feel that. Sure. And and most of the time, if that were the case, um, most of the time you would see a large spike in their vital signs Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. would indicate that they're awake. Okay. That they're basically in a panic state yeah uh, uh, but unable to move to in order to let you know that they're awake so and and usually you want to maintain the person you know in a constant stable vital sign pattern throughout the case so if i suddenly see a spike in their blood pressure their heart rate going through the roof you know then i have to adjust my anesthetic deeper yeah so it's 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 very unlikely that you know you'll encounter a true awareness under anesthesia and like I said, um, it's, it's, there's a greater chance during open heart surgery. And the reason why is because your blood gets recirculated out of your body in order for them to work on your heart. Okay. On the bypass machine. And when it goes through the bypass machine, a lot of the anesthesia might get taken away. And when it gets recirculated in your body, you're, you, know, you can be, start becoming conscious, even though obviously you have muscle relaxation and you're unable to move in order to let people know. So that would be scary. And actually, the movie, it was a, a movie, and I forgot the name of the movie. I don't, it's called I don't, Awake. Awake, I exactly. So. It was <laughs> open heart surgery. I think so, It yeah. was open heart surgery. I know. Um, well, we're going to pause right here and go into our bit of the episode. Um, do you know what time it is, Doc? No, what time is it? Um, it's time to get surgical. Let's get surgical, surgical. I want to hear the doctor talk. Except oh, you're, you're going to be talking. It's oh. for you. Oh, it's for Frankie. Oh, that's <laughs> it good. It is for Frankie. Okay. Tell us about the first time you put someone to sleep. How oh, was that experience? Good. From, you know, how you felt inside to actually what happened. Walk us through that first time. Well, actually, I told the story to Dr. William just a couple weeks ago because uh, for some other reason, I don't know why we got into it, but um, into talking about that. But uh, my first clinical day, they usually give you the day before the attending that, you know, I'm, I'm preparing, I'm, uh, you know. You're nervous. I'm very nervous. You're shitting your pants. <laughs> yes, basically. And we already knew of all the anesthesiology attending in this hospital where mm-hmm. I was going to do this clinical rotation, like the worst one, like the meanest oh, attending man. was his, I can remember his name. I'm terrible with Don't names. Don't say it though. I'm terrible with names, Good, <laughs> but I could still remember his name to this day, and I got assigned to him. It was like everybody was terrorized of the guy, and I got assigned to him my first day. I'm like, okay, great. So I go in, and to top it all off, for some reason, he got reassigned to Pete's. Well, Pete's wasn't really... Pediatrics. Yes, yeah. pediatrics. So Pete's wasn't really the first rotation I was supposed to go into because I hadn't even covered most of Pete's, you know, at that point. Pete's comes usually further ahead. So now I was going to be working with the most uh, terrifying attending anesthesiologist at the hospital. Plus, I'm going to be doing Pete's, which I hadn't really 
adequately prepared for. I mean, I had covered some material, mm -hmm. but I hadn't gone through the full rotation. Okay. Usually you have a signed rotation of pediatrics. Because it's a whole new world. Oh, different pediatrics. Dosing, different drugs. <laughs> yeah, you know. I mean, it, well, different pediatric. airways. I yes. mean, sure. they react differently. Completely different. So then I go in and, you know, he gets assigned. We go into the room. And I actually was very happy that I got my very first intubation with mm -hmm. him. So and I didn't get every single, you know, on that day intubation because it actually, it, you know, we make it look relatively easy mm -hmm. because we've done it so many time. times. But in order to secure someone's airway, it takes a considerable time mm -hmm. to learn that technique. Sure. There are certain adjustments that you have to make to align the axes of your pharynx with your oryx. It's 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 quite uh, challenging. It's a lot more difficult than it looks. And it I, sounds I, difficult. I I mean, as much as I tease Frankie, I mean, he, I, he's phenomenal at starting an IV and mm -hmm. at putting it an endotracheal tube in. I mean, I've I've seen thousands of surgeries in mm -hmm. my life and participated in them, and usually there's some cases where they have to use special equipment in order to be able to see the airway to put the tube in i've never seen frankie need to use that so i'm not surprised you got your first uh intubation in a child which is difficult too right i mean i remember when one of my kids had surgery i and we, i was still mm -hmm. a duke and I wanted this pediatric anesthesiologist to be the one to put him to sleep mm -hmm. because, you know, and he trained at Harvard. Yeah. And you spent some time in Harvard and or at Boston, Mass. And, um, I mean, it, it's a totally different world with that. Well, so. funny thing about that, because that was my first job at Mass General in Boston. And my first intubation there, I failed. Oh, really? <laughs> oh. Yeah. yeah, my first day on the job. It was my first job after I finished school. I, I said, okay, I go in, and my first intubation I failed, so I already felt like an idiot. Like, right in the first day, you know, mm -hmm. the anesthesiologist was looking at me, and I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. You didn't know you were gonna become yeah, so good. Uh, <laughs> but I was always, yeah, it, it was, it was, it, it did hurt a little bit sure. on your first day of work. But yeah, on, on clinicals, I did do good, and fortunately, I mean, there was challenges throughout the program when mm -hmm. you're going through different types of rotations obstetrics everything is sound it's a lot of technique and a yeah. lot of pharmacology that goes into learning anesthesia so how did things go with this uh, terrifying uh, attending and attending? how old was no. the patient the you said the you got the intubation yeah i did i did get the intubation and that was the oh, first well, that I, was your first person you put to sleep then yourself first person supervised sleep, but except for the dummy in the laboratory wait yeah. was this yeah. a little person like a, a young yeah child? it was like a seven oh year old okay he's gonna have some dental work oh, okay done. so it, it went well and right after this, he said oh you did good and then he t promptly told me to uh, uh to insert a sup tylenol suppository in this kid like, <laughs> okay <laughs> i just went <laughs> around to the other side but it went well yeah so it did go well good that's great and then look it led you right here with dr william and at the podcast. Mm -hmm. So those experiences, even the yes, first one you failed, technically, you have succeeded. So yes. it was all worth it. Well, thank you for sharing that story. Do you guys have a memory of the first patient you guys worked on together? Mm, not the first patient. Um, or first time working but, together? Yeah, I just re I, I don't remember exactly the first patient, that, but I, I just, we started working together and you kind of have to be in sync with your sure with yeah the cna and there are so many jokes and and things about you know a, a, everything is always anesthesia's mm -hmm. fault that's the way surgery <laughs> always looks at everything sure you know and most blame of the time someone. it's our fault but we always blame everything on um anesthesia but it's um yeah it i i think it's an impo important um to be able to work with the same person every day because even despite me joking with him about more juice and things like that, he, he knows like when to give certain medications yeah. for different parts of the procedure because you'll move from doing like, for example, with a tummy tuck, we'll, we'll be lifting the skin and the fat and everything off, but then we're gonna need like paralysis, more paralysis at a certain point when we're sewing mm -hmm. the fascia together to bring the muscles. And, and the other thing, and Frankie probably doesn't even know this, but um, like when you're operating on someone and 
you're working in just a certain, let's say I'm operating on the right breast. Well, you make an incision in the breast. That's very stimulating, very painful. Mm -hmm. But they're asleep, so, you know, you, you don't see it. And But then when you've been working on that right breast for a while and now you finish and you go to the left breast, it's a totally new stimulus. Yeah. And I can tell you many, 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 many times working with other CRNAs, you go to the other side and you make your incision and the patient will move a little bit, indicating that they're getting a little bit light and that they they sense that, yeah. that pain. And that just never happens with Frankie because I think working together, he, he knows the tempo of the operation mm -hmm. and anticipates when there's going to be a new stimulus. I mean, I don't know if you do it on purpose or not, but I mean, no, it's no. so well organized that we never get these fluctuations, um, you know, in in the, in the, 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 yeah, in yeah. the level of anesthesia. And th I mean, that that's really something because it, it I think it's much better for the patient. Yeah. It's more enjoyable for me as a surgeon to be operating in that environment. And that's the type of thing that kind of goes unnoticed, but mm -hmm. I, I notice it, and I love that about you, Frankie. <laughs> oh, thank you. You really never had mentioned that. But that, mm -hmm. that actually is a very important point. Mm -hmm. When you work with someone daily, and you know exactly what they're going to be doing, I mean, there's fine adjustments in anesthesia that have to be done based on what part of the procedure they're doing, like, mm -hmm. like he just mentioned, going from one breast to the other. So there's gonna be new stimuli, so I have to adjust my anesthetic before he even starts. So if since we work together, we've been working together exclusively for a little over three years now, mm -hmm. um, basically, you have you 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 know exactly from where to where he's going to and what kind of stimulation he's going to be causing mm -hmm. even for the whole emergence process uh at the end of the procedure to wake the patient up because the less time the patient's under the anesthesia the better right. so as i know how long usually it will take for that procedure to end so i start you know uh, kind of bringing down my anesthesia. And basically, as we're putting the dressings on the patient, the patient's already waking up and going yeah. into recovery. And that can't be done when you don't know the person you're working with because you don't know how long it's going to take. You don't know what kind of stimuli uh, is going to, they're going to cause the patient, you know, what their sequence mm -hmm. of yeah, surgery and, is. And other anesthesia providers have, uh, have said to me, you know, many, many times they're like, well, let me know when you're 10 minutes out. Well, you know, surgeons are terrible at estimating <laughs> their time. And if the patient's waking up earlier than we want, we don't like that very much right, at all. Right, 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 no. And we want them to wake up instantly, which is very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, just you being able, just working together, I think, really facilitates yeah, all that. Yeah, because it's not just flipping a switch. Sure. You know, and it's you, there's a whole process it's a, a whole time period of emergence mm -hmm. so knowing your surgeon or working with him daily you kind of you can kind of prepare for that mm -hmm. and have that kind of smooth emergence we're going to wake up nice comfortable they're not going to be moving because he doesn't want any movement sure. before you know dressings are on and everything and at the same time they're going to wake up promptly after so then now let me ask about uh post-op with anesthesia and the waking up, why, <laughs> whenever I've come out of general anesthesia, why am I so overwhelmingly nauseous? Like before I open my eyes, the nausea is the most immediate. And I know that has happened with, um, I don't know if it's like a genetic thing we're disposed to or whatever, because it happens with with the other women in my family. Um, is that common, that amount of nausea? Okay, well, or you know what you know what is what should patients expect to feel as they're well, coming back? To? I'm guessing you're a non-smoker, right? Okay, so you're already right here, real quick. You already have three risk factors: you're female, you're young, you're non-smoker. So those are already yeah, risk factors. Yeah, female. <laughs> that is for, a risk factor for having nausea. Those are, so the young females female. who do not smoke. smoke. Or so risk if, factors. You, if you smoke, you have you have less, less nausea. Less nausea. Oh, I never I yeah. never knew that. But don't smoke, girls. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. not a. Are you being specific to like cigarettes and tobacco smoking? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nicotine, as opposed so, to like marijuana. Well, it's a, it's a whole area, a PNOV, right? Yes. Postoperative nausea, and vomiting. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's 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 a big thing for for. So this is common. Like this anesthesia. Is, yeah. yeah. So we, we do uh, the 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 best approach for postoperative nausea and vomiting mm -hmm. is to try to 
use a multimodal approach of different medications that will block different receptors in your brain, mm -hmm. what they call the chemoreceptor tr trigger mm -hmm. zone. So by blocking these different receptors will try to minimize the chances of having nausea. One thing that you can do is try, you know, obviously uh, be cognizant of whatever meals you've had the day before, oh, etc. Yeah. But it, not only we block these receptors, we also, uh, another uh, methodology is to adequately hydrate the patient during the surgery that also helps minimize the chances of nausea. But even procedures, procedures that have, that involve uh, insufflation, when they do laparoscopic procedures, uh, and they insufflate ECO2 in order to uh, have visualization, uh, that actually increases your chances of having nausea after surgery. Yeah, I always say, get the Zofran ready to go yeah. immediately. But every well, you single, give everybody every, Zofran, Every right? single Just, patient yeah. gets Zofran and some uh, Decadron, which mm -hmm. is a steroid. And the, most studies show that both medications together have a greater chance mm -hmm. of trying to prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. Now, for the extreme cases of patients that have... Like if, uh, if Gabby came in, she said, hey, yeah, I get exactly. nauseated, what would you do? I would, I would tell you, ask your primary care physician, yeah. primary care physician for a scopolamine patch. Oh, there's the day, patches. Yeah, it's a little patch. You put it in your mastoid process. Is this and just you put specific it to surgery you, yeah, or but you, day today? You put it behind your ear <laughs> the night before surgery. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work as well if you do it the day of surgery. Okay. Do it the night before surgery. It causes some mild sedation. Okay. So you're maybe a little sleepy, mm -hmm. but and be sure to let your anesthesia provider know oh, okay. that you got the patch because, it, for like for everything, maybe he has to make small adjustments in the amount of of um, sedation that mm -hmm. he gives you because to compensate because all these medications yeah. have synergistic effects. So I used to routinely use scopolamine patches on all of my. I didn't know this existed. Patients. But a game they're they're for like, motion sickness. Yes, but a lot of people they're, use them when they go. go Honestly, I feel let down and disappointed because I have nausea every day. Like most of the time, especially when I've had surgery, I come out, I didn't even open my, my eyes before the vomiting started happening. Wow, yeah. So like I have extreme, like for me, surgery, it going is to genetic the, the though, right? anxiety yes, part is the components. post, the way I'm going to be feeling after, not the actual procedure or being out or waking you're up. Not, it's you're the not anxiety worried about the, the needle, nothing. No, nothing you're worried nothing. about it's throwing It's the, the nausea that I can't, it's, yeah. I can't like no, catch my breath. Most people who have severe post-operative nausea mm -hmm. vomiting, they, they have, they, tell you they have they're more afraid of the actual yeah. nausea than pain or anything yeah. else my mom is the same way where well, yeah. you, can, you throw can everything at them though right like i, I give so every Zofran, single patient. decadron scopolamine patch and uh, plenty of fluids hydrogen fluids, hydration uh what about, do you use reglan or any of those no. uh um other any other drugs that you that you use for that no no those are the my the, the main go-to's yeah main so go for patients the night before you know do the patch notify the doctors notify the whole team but then would it help for patients to you know extra water intake the days before would that just make a little bit of a difference or it doesn't really matter well, your body's you're you're things. not like a um a camel like you can't mm -hmm. really what do you mean I'm not? store up <laughs> up fluid well i used to hear that in in lacrosse with my kids you know the coach would be like make sure you drink a lot of you know fluid you know we're playing next week kind of thing well it's you can't store it up as a human yeah. you're just going to you know, pa past there, it's going to produce more urine, but certainly up until midnight. Yes, you you'd want to oh, you right. know have so a you couple glasses of water before mm -hmm. you go to bed. What it, answered me this question, Frankie? Um, so why does somebody have to be what we call MPO or nothing per oris? Now they can't eat or drink anything after midnight per sur surgery, right? We, yeah, even no, Kramer no, knows question. that. Uh, Kramer didn't know that. On the, see that Seinfeld, he's like, no, you got to eat before surgery. You I don't think strength. I've seen that episode, but no, yes, yeah, like, you I always that But, you know, that's the rule, right? You have to yeah. be MPO after midnight. So explain to to us why is, why is that? Because it's an that? anesthesia issue, not a surgery issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So basically the, the concern with someone having anything to eat or drink before the procedure or just hours before the procedure is that if that – that food or or substance fluid that has not left yet your stomach and hasn't started driving down into your intestines when i give you the the, the medications to induce anesthesia uh, it relaxes um the sphincters in your esophagus in your stomach and that food can actually your protective reflexes your cough reflexes your gag reflexes they actually are abated 
by the, the sedative medications that I give. Yeah. So that medication can actually slip up through your esophagus, into your trachea, and the get food. into the food uh, and liquid into your lungs. And that was, is what we call aspiration. And dangerous. And that is very mm -hmm. dangerous. Life threatening. Cause yeah. li life oh threatening complications. And at the least, you're probably going to buy yourself a bed in a nearby hospital in an ICU. Yeah. Yeah. Do so not they, eat yeah, or so, drink so, after and, and, midnight. And I, and I, and I've, I've put fear into a lot of patients that try to sometimes, you know, perhaps they spoke to someone in the reception desk or the girl that was preparing mm -hmm. them before I saw them and they mentioned that they ate something. And then when I talk to them, they're like, no, no, I was wrong, I didn't eat. And then I have to go over all of this and say, this is really risky. Yeah. Your safety is our number one yeah. concern. It's more important than any other thing. I mean, you were here to do a elective procedure mm -hmm. um, and to better yourself, and you don't want any complications to occur and for you to end up in a hospital. Yeah. It's, 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 it's mind-boggling to me that some people try to try to. But I've, uh, I've seen Frankie with patients and you know there's some uncertainty as to what the timing is or what they sure. ate or whatnot and they change your story a little mm -hmm. bit and then when frankie's like okay well you could die they're like yeah i had a cheeseburger uh, three hours ago <laughs> 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 it's like okay Straight right. to we're the gonna point. do your surgery tomorrow yeah. okay, please yeah. do not eat or drink yeah be honest midnight. but also just save yeah. yourself the time and because it, it, trouble. It, it, don't eat or drink after midnight. and we've seen patients in the hospital who you know, let's say, for example, get drunk and and then they they pass out and they aspirate at, at home and they come in with a whopping, you know, pneumonitis or pneumonia and this inflammation. I mean, it, it it's it's no joke. I mean, yeah. the, the whole not eating before surgery is is not there just for, you know, yeah. for without without good without cause. Reason, yeah. What uh, what are some what's something else we want to uh, ask? Uh, Frankie, what yeah, about is there the any IV? Other, yeah, um, important things patients should know, or you know, to prepare and expect. Do you put a needle in with the IV? Tell me about your your IV. All right. Well, the IV is th there is a needle just to in order to puncture the skin, and uh, but actually it's just a little small plastic catheter that mm -hmm. stays inside. So a lot of people. It's funny because especially if I I put it in the anti-cubital area. Uh, the patient will, will stay with their arms straight down. Yeah, they won't, it's a natural. They, they don't want to bend their arm because they're mm -hmm. thinking that there's like a metal yeah. object and it's just going to rip through their yeah. skin. It's or, terrifying. Or, <laughs> it's terri well, and I feel like, like even I've seen it's plastic, it still feels like unnatural. And, it, and it's just a very floppy little plastic mm -hmm. that doesn't really, you yeah. know, you can bend your arm normally. And, and usually the expectation, uh, what I find, uh, and I think, you know, Carl will agree with me that their expectation is of how that's going to be, um, that's how that's going to hurt is, is greater than what it actually ends up mm -hmm. being. And uh, what I try to do is I, I'm talking to the patient constantly throughout the time that I'm starting the IV. A lot of times I, I'll do it in the pre-op room mm -hmm. and I'm going through their history and asking them questions or or even if I finish, I'm asking about what they do for a living, where they're from, because we get a lot of patients from other states that come down to have surgery with Dr. William. So, um, and the, by the time that they're answering questions, they're not really thinking about it, boom, the needles. And I try to do it as quickly as possible. Because some people, they're holding their arms and they're like, okay, I want you to tell me. And they're all nervous and they're shaking. I'm like, and I'm try, trying to talk. And then suddenly I just grab the arm and boom, I just put it in. Especially because it's just gonna be, you yeah, know, yeah. A, an easier, easier experience, way, yeah. and they're like, and I'm, and then I look at them. And it's like, see, it was it that bad? They're like, oh, not really. And I'm like, see, All right. Well, and well. and what um, what about having like I know for example with reconstructive surgery, sometimes we'd have patients we'd have to take them to the operating room frequently. Sometimes every day, particularly at children, if you can't do something at the bedside, they can't tolerate it. You have to put them asleep, and so people will have like sequential anesthesia is like daily i mean I've, I've sometimes done that for you know two weeks or or whatnot for people that have these bad injuries yeah. it, it, and i mean we always told them you know there's no harm in having an anesthetic every day um and i think that there is sort of a misconception out there that you can't do that can you just speak towards that well, I, I think that that goes back to when most of the anesthesia gases, you know, th not the, the most 
common ones that we use today, but the older mm -hmm. were highly metabolized in your organs, like in the liver and such. And it could be harmful for you to it have. It could build up. It can build up. And you, But nowadays, most of the anesthesia gases that are used, mm -hmm. most of them less than 1% is actually metabolized. So the fact of the matter is that you're just, like I had spoken before, you just breathe them out mm -hmm. and the, your body's not really having to take care of all, of all that metabolism it makes a huge difference. And propofol, which is the medications that you used um, right at induction, is the, the half-life is, is considerably fast and you're, it's eliminated quickly from your body in less than 24 hours. So so if someone says to you, like, on the, the next day after surgery, like, well, I'm still feeling the effects of anesthesia, you that's not really true. No. There is no anesthetic in their body the next day. It's all gone. And it's safe to undergo an anesthesia the next day. Yes. Completely well. safe. So you don't want to – it's okay to, I guess, have it frequently, but you don't want to be under for – longer than necessary the shorter amount of time yeah no uh, and of course and and whenever we we do that i mean we try to operate as sort of quickly as, as we can in terms of the patient sure. being asleep and and not just you know go for lunch for an hour while the patient <laughs> sleeps or something like that or, that's you know, a good idea yeah, yeah we're mindful of all mm -hmm. that yeah you can just order the food there okay. yeah mm -hmm. yeah exactly. have delivery. <laughs> frankie thank you so much for all the insight well, thank you for having me no of course and you know fun. now it's time for the most fun moment of the episode it's oh, time for the og wheel oh i was waiting for this oh uh, yeah you like I'm, the wheel uh, i uh, am uh, always uh, waiting for yeah, this. i mean i love the wheel we do love the wheel i'm just always uh, hoping for a non-tiktok even though i love tiktok I'm pretty sure I'm not. Uh, Frankie, you're so on the wheel. Yeah, and I don't think we've ever landed on we've Frankie. We've never landed on Frankie. If you know, you know. I mean, it's kind of dude. That would be perfect for it to land on Frankie today. What do you get with the Frankie? If you know, well, we'll have to see if it lands. Oh, okay. Yeah. If Let's you know, see. Say. You know. All right. She's here. She's arrived as beautiful as ever. Let's see what we're going to get today. Are you okay to spin? Do you, I mean, I've been doing it. I'm not in any pain. No, I, I, yeah, no, we're okay. We're oh, okay. okay. We're good. good. We're good. Thank you. I appreciate you checking. My, oh, beauty pageant question. Oh, that was close to Frankie. Uh, it was close to Frankie. Wonder, so we will get a question. Both will answer today. All right, here we go. Now, imagine yourself full glam in your gowns. You're up on the stage. Here comes your question. We won't play the uh, video response back until you both answer. It's up to you if you want to go individually or uh, collaboratively. All right. So no, I've never done this, so let them do it first. <laughs> oh, you, do, you want to take it together? No, no, no. You do it. Okay, let's let's okay. do it individually. Yeah. But guess first, please. Yeah. Okay. No, this is a this is a good one. This is a good question. Cyberbullying is one of the greatest problems facing the world today. How would you solve this? Go, go ahead, oh, Frankie. You're, you're the guest. <laughs> this is a difficult one. Yeah, How this is not an easy topic. Yeah, no, yeah, no, no. This is a quite a difficult topic. I can't even... There are no wrong answers, but answers that our viewers will judge you for. So. Oh, wow. That's still with pressure <laughs> now. You should. So read the question one more time. Not Gabby. a problem. All right, Frankie. Cybersecurity. Cyberbullying is one of the greatest problems facing the world today. How would you solve this? Well, um, I think that the, I, I actually never really looked into um, the laws in response in, in respect to this, but I think that people either online or in real life, they have to be held accountable mm -hmm. for whatever actions that they take. So a anything that would apply to, you know, in-person bullying should be the same in the cyberspace. Dr. William? That's a great answer, Frankie. That was a great answer, yeah. Thank you. I would create a cyber police force <laughs> yes. to go yes. through, find these bullies, <laughs> and reprimand them in take away their social media privileges. Yeah. I get cyber bullied all the time. I mean, people will, will leave comments. I never mind if people leave a comment about mm -hmm. me because, you know, <laughs> as you know, Frankie, I mean, it usually makes me laugh. I yeah. Mean, it's, I, yeah. I really don't mind. Um, that type of thing because I, I see it funny and a lot of times it's, it's kind of you know truthful so <laughs> but I don't like when people cyber bully if I make a post and they cyber bully the p 
patient. Yeah, no. You know, like this doesn't look good, or they should have done that. Yeah, they, like no that's that. this that's mm -hmm. this person. Leave them alone. Yeah. If they want to come after me, I'm happy to do it. But I, I would I would really crack down on it because I I know it is a serious problem. It is. I was cyberbullied in high school. Were you? Yes, I was, and it was awful. But I'm a funnier person from it. So and karma yeah. kicked in. Yeah, so I mean we're never that. gonna stop it. But yeah, but we can try well, our best to. The funny thing <laughs> about the actually yesterday, I don't know if it was released yesterday, but yesterday I started watching. I didn't finish it, but uh, there's a series on Netflix that just came up, and it's called Are You Up? Mm -hmm. And it, it was, uh, I probably uh, either I wasn't paying attention because I was too busy getting yelled up by the telemarketing. <laughs> thing. But um, it was early in the 2000s. And this guy was benefiting from uh, people posting uh, um, pictures of people naked in oh, their yeah. website. Uh, I think Hunter Moore yeah. is his name. I had never heard of him, but apparently he was quite. And then people would like put uh, revenge porn up, and yeah. it was it became a huge thing. Yeah. I don't. I didn't finish the the series, but I just started watching it. Yesterday. You have to be strict with. But that. there is yeah. apparently well, I'll tell you the ending. There are still laws. really awful people out yeah, there. Yeah, but I I guess there was some kind of like um, law that came mm -hmm. into play because yeah. of this guy of this what yeah. happened. So. Well, let's hear what an actual beauty pageant contestant had to say in response to this question. Cyberbullying is actually affecting our nations because many people are getting ad psychological tortures. So the best way to, do, to deal with it is to introduce a regulation and the rules that governs all the social media such as Facebook, Instagram, and um, maybe WhatsApp. In case you send something which is not uh, up to standard, you'll be fine. Thank you so much. Oh, she kind of nailed it. Yeah, that's kind of what you guys said. You guys have never given the same answer, so that worked out. Yeah, that was the first mm -hmm. time. Okay, good job. Good answer. You know, Family feud, good answer. Good answer. I was just, I it was in Oslo in Norway over the summer uh, vacation, and um, we met this other group of people at the table, and they had consumed a massive amount of wine, and mm -hmm. we, had, we had consumed a uh, similar amount <laughs> yeah. and we were going uh, walking down the street and we were going to um, a different restaurant and the one of the fellows had a, had a scooter you know the little ones that you kind of put your foot on and mm -hmm. then they got a little motor and he he the the city downtown in Oslo there's no cars in the central core permitted so it's just all walking and mm -hmm. bicycles and scooters and his buddy's like hey you should not be using your scooter and i was like yeah you're gonna break a wrist or yeah. something you know like you definitely don't need to be doing <laughs> yeah. that after drinking a lot of wine and um then his buddy said to me no no i'm not worried about him breaking his wrist i'm worried about getting a dui oh yeah and i'm like what and he told me that in oslo uh, or norway just a week before that or something if you get pulled over by the police operating a scooter, like mm -hmm. the little things you see people all for, Lauderdale, South Beach. Yeah, you could get a DUI. You can get a DUI. Here, yeah. He, he yeah. said that um, they we're would lose. Like non motorized. No, the, like the regular scooter. The little, that you go like a push scooter? Yes. Well, no, 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 no. The ones that can have their own. Yeah, no, this one no, also had like a little scooter. motor. No, yeah. it had a little oh, thing motor. in yeah. addition, okay. yeah. And uh, I, I didn't know it was here as well, but he's, he's like, yeah, you, you will lose your license for one, like your driver's license mm. for one year. Turns out you can't be reckless. Shocking. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for joining us on this new episode of Behind the Mask, the podcast, Dr. William, Frankie. Thank you guys so much. It has been a pleasure. It has been a joy. And to all of our listeners, don't forget to like, subscribe, comment. If there's any questions we haven't covered or gotten to, anything you want to know, let us know so that we can answer it for you. But until then, listen, follow along, head over to Apple Music, Spotify, YouTube to watch along and not just listen and if, we look forward to hanging out with if you, you have any again. questions specifically <laughs> for frankie or if you just want a better look at him then, there you go then please leave comments below <laughs> and See, he'll he'll be happy to answer this is the type of bullying that of, goes on in these, the office any of these questions imagine my face when he came frankie. in I'm a big he came frankie in with pen. that big head big frankie pen <laughs> look at this yeah <laughs> frankie looks so good uh, there's two so frankie oh, frankie was awesome all right well great Thank you. Great to have you on the podcast. Thank you, guys. Yeah, Frankie. The mask. The podcast.
That is the mask, the Frankie uh, mask. <laughs> Oh, when he came See, in why with you gotta that, get one of him? Yeah, no, yeah, that's right. That's a great idea. Yeah. Whenever, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Whenever I have to call the attention of someone, I'll put on my Carl face. Yeah. On. <laughs>